Well, good evening to you all. Welcome into God's house. It's good to be together and uh, give a particularly warm welcome to uh, Daniel, who's come all the way from Cambridge to preach God's word to us. So very good to see you again, Daniel. And uh, we pray God will bless you as you preach to us. We're going to start our service by singing number 59 in the mission praise. 59, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Number 59, we'll stand when the music starts. Proverbs again this evening. We're going to read Proverbs chapter 2. And uh, as uh, we probably said last time, uh, this is uh, wisdom personified. And uh, of course, we know that the wisdom of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Proverbs 2 My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saints. 
then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity and every good path. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you, understanding will keep you, to deliver you from the way of evil, from the man who speaks perverse things, from those who leave the path of righteousness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perversity of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and who are devious in their paths, to deliver you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God, for her house leads down to death and her paths to the dead. None who go to her return, nor do they regain the paths of life. So you may walk in the way of goodness and keep to the paths of righteousness. For the upright will dwell in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the earth and the unfaithful will be uprooted from it. So reads God's word. And if we were to ask ourselves, uh, wouldn't it be great to find the knowledge of God? Wouldn't it be great to find out more about him, to understand uh, the Son of God, of course, is the embodiment of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the knowledge of God? And what we need to do is incline our hearts to God's word and to ask the Holy Spirit to help us uh, to understand it. And uh, so this is a teaching of God's word. Now we're going to sing a second hymn and it's number 476. Now you may or may not know this one. I'm hoping that others apart from me and presumably Daniel who chose it uh, will know it. Um, but if you don't know it, uh, then it's um, it, the music is made up of minims and semi briefs. In other words, particularly towards the end of the lines, you've got to hold your notes. Uh, so it, hopefully it's, it's not a complicated tune, but hopefully you'll get used to the timing uh, of, of the hymn. Number four, seven, six, and uh, it is a, it's a, a hymn about the love of uh, the Lord Jesus and what he has done for us uh, on the cross. My Lord, what love is this? Number four, seven, six. Love is this so dearly that I, the guilty one, may go free. Amazing love would sacrifice the Son of God. My dirty pays and my dirty dies, and I, I live, and I, I live. And so they watched him die, despised, rejected. But all the blood he shed flowed for me. Amazing love, oh, what sacrifice the Son of God gave for me. My debt he pays, my debt he dies, and I. I live and I, I live and now this love of Christ shall flow like rivers and wash the hills away live 
My death he pays, and my death he dies, and I might live, and I might live. Well, that wasn't too bad, was it? I was practicing that this afternoon, but uh, he played it differently to what I sang it. So, uh, but nevertheless, great, great, great hymn. Well, let's come to God in prayer and uh, remind ourselves as we come to him of the things that we have read uh, and sung about. Let's pray. Lord, our God, we thank you this evening that we can come uh, to you freely and unhindered. We thank you that we read of you in your word as the Lord God Most High, uh, El Elyon. And we read of that when Abraham uh, came back from the spoils and met Melchizedek, and we read of it there that uh, he was priest of God Most High. And we see that uh, this this phrase is used many times in the Old Testament, uh, in in Psalms and in the Prophets. And also, of course, we read that Nebuchadnezzar had to learn the lesson that you were God Most High. He was the most powerful king that the world had ever seen and yet he learned humility and obedience uh, to you and he learned to acknowledge that you were God most high and so we remind ourselves of that this evening as we come into your house that we're not just coming together we're not just coming to somebody who's fairly important uh, but we are coming to the Lord God most high the one who is the highest above all things the one who rules and reigns the one who has the things of uh, this world uh, in his hands. And it's good for us to remind ourselves of that, Lord, because this world sometimes seems a world full of chaos, a world full of contradictions, a world full of battles and strife. Whether it be people striving over money and pay, whether they be striving over ideology and sinful ways, whether they be striving for personal gain uh, and influencing others, Uh, to come to their way of thinking that they might have power. Lord, we see all of these things going on uh, in our land uh, and across the seas. We see, Lord, that there is a war going on and the so-called superpowers are all uh, lined up and have all counted their armaments and all feeling that they are pretty secure and they are safe. But let, Lord, with one word from you and the nations would melt. You are that sword of God you are so high you are all powerful and so we come to you as the all powerful God this evening in this little room in this seemingly fairly insignificant town uh, uh, to worship you there's nothing about us that is worthy of, of worshiping you Lord we are just dust in the scales but we thank you that you are God and you are not some distant God someone who doesn't care but you are our father and the one who has loved us from before the world was ever made. And so we come with a sense, Lord, of holiness and and, uh, humbleness. We come with a sense of trepidation uh, that uh, we come into the presence of someone who is so powerful and who is so mighty. And yet, Lord, we come also with joy as we think about the hymns that we have sung. We can sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, because uh, we have come to him in faith as he has invited us to. And we, Lord, can sing somewhat more solemnly uh, about the amazing love, the sacrifice that the Lord Jesus uh, gave for us. He could have done things, it seems to us, so much easier, so much better. He could have come in, in all sorts of ways, and yet the way you chose for him was to come into this world as a man and to suffer uh, the, the constrictions of a human body and get go all the way to the cross, uh, allowing wicked men to nail him to a cross of wood and there he was to die in agony, allowing people to spit on him and mock him, the one who made them, the one who gave them the very breath that they used to curse him. Lord, we are amazed at your goodness and your kindness to, to us and to all men. And so we pray this evening as we worship you that you would come amongst us and bless us as you promised to. And we thank you for that promise, Lord, how amazing it is that the Most High God 
would, uh, as it were, condescend to meet with us. And yet you have promised that wherever two or three are gathered, there you will be in the midst. And so we claim that promise tonight. We ask that for each one of us, that you would come amongst us and bless us. We pray for those who are not well, that you would lift them and touch their bodies. We pray for those who are low in spirit, that, Lord, you would come afresh in grace and mercy and touch their spirits, that they may revive again uh, and sing your praises uh, and walk uh, in your ways. Lord, we pray that you would bless each and every one gathered before you. We pray for those not, uh, not well and not here. Uh, we think once again uh, of uh, Jill McCarthy and we thank you for progress so far. We pray for her that you would continue to bless her and heal her. We thank you for baby Thomas who is uh, off the ventilator and uh, we pray Lord God that uh, you would continue to have your hand upon this little one that he may uh, get uh, fully better that he would have a full uh, health. We know there's a long way to go humanly speaking but we thank you for what you have done so far and we pray that you would continue to have your hand uh, upon this little lad. Mm. Pray for his mum and his dad. We pray for all the family, mm. that you would bless them and keep them. Mm. You said in your word, Lord, you will keep him in perfect peace, mm. whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Mm. Lord, we pray, help uh, the family to trust in you, each and every one, <coughs> that they may come to know you and to know you deeper uh, and to walk with you. Yes. And so we just lift them up to you <coughs> and pray that you would uh, bless them mm. and so heavenly father we uh, come to you and asking you that you would have mercy uh, upon our nation we pray for our king and our royal family and our <coughs> government and it seems uh, sometimes a fantastic thing that we should pray for them it's such a a world away from where we are but lord you've commanded us to pray and so we pray we pray for them that you would give them wisdom and strength and moral courage to pass good laws to repeal bad laws. Amen. We're given the reason in your word that we should pray for these people uh, so that we can live at peace, so that we can have freedom to preach the gospel Amen. and to uh, tell out the good news <coughs> of the Lord Jesus in word uh, and uh, by our lives. And so we pray for that. Amen. And we pray for our city, we pray for this area, uh, that you would have mercy upon us. <coughs> Uh, who live all around this place. We thank you for the encouragements we have uh, had lately of new people coming in. We pray that they would return. Amen. We pray that, Lord, you would find them a home with us, mm. that they with us may be joined and that we may grow together mm. in the knowledge uh, and fear of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. And so, Lord, we give ourselves to you this evening. We pray that you would take us and use us in your work. We pray that you would take us and use us according to the gifts that you have given us and sometimes we feel our gifts are so insignificant we feel that we are so unworthy and we feel that we are so poor in the way that we do things but lord we thank you that you don't look at us like that we thank you that you look at us uh, as a father looks upon his dearly beloved child and you have loved us you continue to love us you are patient with us you know our frame the psalmist says you you remember that we are dust we're not strong but Lord, with your help, we can do all things. And so we pray that whether it just be a word of encouragement at the coffee morning, whether it be an invitation to come to a service, uh, whether it be um, some practical work in some way or other, Lord, whatever it may be, help us to do it for you. Help us to give ourselves to you and to your people and to your work. And so Lord, we thank you for all your goodness to us. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gospel that we have. And we pray this evening as we have Daniel come and uh, bless uh, and preach to us. We pray that you would bless him and help him. We pray for Rachel who's not able to come tonight if she's not well. Just lift her up before you Lord and pray that you would heal her and restore her quickly to, to health. So we thank you Lord for all your goodness to us. Uh, the psalmist says, bless the Lord O my soul. All that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord and my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Lord, we're quick to forget. But tonight we say thank you for all your goodness to us. And we pray that you will continue with us now. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to read. And uh, I didn't double check this, but I'm, I'm, we're going to read from Psalm 23. Uh, so uh, 
Um, let's do that. Uh, I know that uh, for some of us, we could uh, quote this psalm off by heart, but it's, it's a good thing to listen. And, and because it's poetry, every word counts. Always remember that. When it's poetry, every word counts. And so as we look at the words and read the words and think about the words, ask yourself, why, why are these words? Why are these things? Why are these things here? What is the Lord speaking uh, to us tonight? Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You, pre you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Well, before we come to consider something of that psalm, let's sing number 708, To God Be the Glory, number 708. Wait for a moment to catch up with the music. Thank you. All right. Can you play the music? Great things he has taught us. Great things he has done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But your and higher and greater will. As, as usual, good evening. It's, it's great to be here with you all. Um, 
You'll notice, I'm, and as Gary said, I'm on my own, uh, so you'll just have to deal with me tonight. Uh, Rachel's a bit unwell. Uh, she's had a, a stomach virus for a little while, um, but she's on the mend, and she sends her <coughs> greetings and blessings to you all. Um, so we'll be looking again at the great psalm of Psalm 23. I think the last three or four times I've been here, we've been... Uh, making our way through this wonderful uh, psalm. I, I, I told someone that the church I attend in Cambridge, I was preaching on one verse of this uh, psalm this evening, and he said it's, it's sometimes the, it's the passages that we know a lot. We, we take them for granted sometimes because we've read them so often. Many will probably know the whole psalm off by heart, but I think even for me, uh, preparing a sermon, there's so much new treasure that can be unearthed each time I reread the psalm, I reread a verse in the psalm. And even though I, 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 poetry was one of my least favorite things at school, uh, Gary made a good point. Each word is there uh, for a reason that the psalmist David has put inspired by the Holy Spirit. So we'll be looking uh, at Psalm 23, specifically verse 5 today. Um, but I think a, a, a brief recap on about last time when I was here on uh, verse 4 uh, will be a good place to start, which will probably become clearer soon as to why. Uh, so let's look at verse 4 again briefly of Psalm 23. Well, I'll read the whole thing again. Why not? So from verse 1 of Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So again, last time I would say we looked uh, in more detail at verse 4. I was going to say it's maybe the most famous or well-known verse, but it, I guess most of the psalm is as well-known as the rest. Verse 4 again, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It speaks of the valley of the shadow of death. It's, it's, it's that figure of death like a shadow looming over everything we do on this earth, in our lives. Death is that great inescapable thing. It's the only inescapable part of life that we can try and put it off, that we can try and run away and hide from it or exercise it away. But it will always catch up to us, every one of us. And we see death all around us in this world. We turn on the news, we see terrible things happening. Disasters, wars. Death is everywhere that we look. And which paints a bit of a grim picture. But the crux of <coughs> verse 4 in particular is that God is there with us in the valley. He doesn't leave us. He speaks of this, the valley of the shadow of death. And it's God who is the one who leads us into the valley. And it's God also who is the one who leads us through the valley and out the other side. He takes us into the valley, not as our final destination, but he takes us through the valley to get to somewhere better. And we, we don't often know the, the journey or the directions that God is taking us. Mm -hmm. And I always think, I, I, I imagine that as, 
even when I was a child on a, on a long car journey, maybe my, we used to drive to Wales a lot and I had no idea of the route or the roads. My dad would drive and sometimes I'd fall asleep, I'd wake up and be like, where, where are we? Are we still in England? Are we in Wales yet? And ch as children, we, we, we like to ask, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Where are we? Sometimes we can be like that with God. When we go through certain situations, certain struggles, when we grieve, when we mourn, when we suffer loss, sometimes we can ask God, what's happening? Why are we in this situation? How long, O oh Lord, will we be here? Mm. But Jesus is our good shepherd, which is the thread of this psalm. And the shepherd does more than just guide and navigate us through this valley. It's not like a, he's not like a GPS who says, go left in a hundred yards or whatever. But he is there with us in the car, if you like. He is the one in control. He's the navigator directing us through. And he does more. He is very present with us. He fights for us when we can't on our own. And verse 4 says, We need not fear because his rod and his staff are with us. They comfort us. He defends us through all that we go through in this life. All the attacks that we come under. He fights for us. He defends us. He gave his life for us. And the valleys of this life, whether it be the physical death or suffering, tribulations, whatever it may be, they're inevitable. We can't just shrug them off they can spring up at any time for any one of us and they can seem to come in from any direction sometimes multiple ones at once we may be plunged into the darkness of a valley overnight we may experience struggles loss and mourning and betrayal whether that be at work in our relationships friendships whatever it may be but all of those things are just temporary. And Jesus is our good shepherd. We can rest and rely on him, the light of the world, to take us through and to shine the path and to lead us out. And so we get to verse 5 of Psalm 23. Our main focus tonight, which I'll read again. Verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil my cup runs over and this verse it's almost the opposite of the one before in a way it speaks of abundance and blessing and of course psalm 23 overall is a ver as a psalm of abundance and blessing And as we sang in our first hymn, there is, we can sing of blessed assurance because Jesus is ours. I think it's important when uh, either reading or preaching from a verse like Psalm 23 verse 5, we shouldn't just fixate on this verse alone and neglect everything else around it, the other verses in the psalm. We shouldn't, in a way, distort what this verse is saying i think it's probably an easy one for those prosperity preachers to twist into their own uh, agendas and use to say that our lives will be full of well ease and comfort and physical abundance but that's not always the case is it we know that as Christians, we know that our life is often one of struggle. Even with Christ, it's not smooth sailing. It's not all 
endless sunshine and rainbows. We just have to look at the verse before again, verse 4, to be reminded that this life isn't all that God has in store for us. This life is not the destination. It's not our final resting place. So as believers, it's important for us not to fall into complacency in this life. Not to think that everything will go our way because we are in Jesus. We can't think that just because we have been saved by the blood of Christ that everything will go our way. In fact, it's quite the opposite, isn't it? We are told to expect trouble and persecutions and valleys and trials. So with all of that in mind, we can take another look at verse 5. And I'll break it into maybe three chunks, if you like. The first one, we'll look at the bit where it says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The second part, you anoint my head with oil. And the third, my cup runs over. I think the first thing to do is when we look at this verse, it, we, we can see there's a shift in imagery. In the, from the first four verses to verse five and six. It's like the imagery, the metaphor changes. The first four verses... Well, for one, they're outdoors, aren't they? Being in fields and pastures and by still waters and streams and valleys. Verse 5 and 6, we're inside. And the subject or subjects that are being spoken about, they also change. Verses 1 to 4, they speak of of sheep and their shepherd. And the last two verses, guests and a host at a banquet. We go from a sense of guidance and journeying to arrival and celebration. So the first part of the verse, you prepare a table before me. The Lord Jesus is our good shepherd and we focused on that in the last few times I've been here. And now he is our host our host who prepares a table before us, a feast of abundance. And in many ways, this verse points beyond the things of this life, but it doesn't neglect or ignore the things of this life. Obviously, I'm sure we all know that some people uh, in our lives who may be blessed in ways that are financial, in material things, in possessions. This verse isn't focused on, those, on that kind of abundance. But there is still a table prepared before us. So what's on that table? What is prepared for us? I think a big part of what is on the table for us is just the pure joy and contentedness that floods and fills our hearts when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It's the life-saving and life-changing power of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. It just fills every corner of our body, our heart, our mind, our life, It's the life-giving gift of Christ's new and fulfilled everlasting life that his resurrection power gives us. It's the peace and the gratitude that fills us when we know that our sins, and when I say our sins, it's not just like a small list. It's like an endless catalogue of sins even bigger than those Argos catalogues that, I I don't know if they still have those, but even bigger than those catalogues, all of those sins that we've committed in our lives, that we are still committing 
and that we are yet to come in. It's the peace and gratitude of knowing that all of those sins are washed away. That we have received complete forgiveness because of Christ's blood. And also it's knowing that the penalty, the guilt and the shame of our sin have also been done away with. They've been extinguished and dissolved. Also on the table, it, it, it's that transformation that changes our lives completely and forever when we turn away from our lives of sin and turn to a life with Christ, our Savior. We all have our stories to tell, our testimonies of how we were once different apart from Christ. Maybe we acted in ways that we wouldn't act now. Maybe we lived in outright sin, in public sin or private sin. But with Christ, I think we can all agree that we are different, we are completely changed to the very core of our being. Obviously, some of our testimony, some of our stories, some will be more, uh, shall I say, dramatic than others. But all of them at their heart are the same because they all have Jesus at their heart. Jesus creates in us a new heart. He gives us a new life where once we were dead in our transgressions and sins, completely bound and enslaved by them. We could do nothing else but sin until Christ comes into our life. And we have profound joy, peace and contentedness <coughs> in the Lord God. And that shines through any adverse situation or scenario that we may go through, that we may face today or tomorrow. That may never go away in this life. I think, well, I've heard it say that, that Christians should be the happiest people on earth. But we should definitely be the most joyful and full of joy. We don't always have to be happy, but we should always be full of joy for what God has done for us. We can just look at some of the apostles in Acts. After they were on trial for, for preaching about Jesus, and after they were released, it says in Acts uh, 5, 40, I think 41, so they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Amen. It doesn't sound like, a, like sad people, but ones who are full of joy, and a joy that's not of this world, but a joy that's from God. And we can do the same by God's grace. It's obviously, I, th I think, easier said than done to rejoice in our sufferings. But Christ gives us that ability because he has filled every corner, every cell of our bodies and of our being. You prepare a table before me. In the presence <coughs> of my enemies. I think we're fortunate here in the UK that we don't really have like physical enemies that would seek to do us harm or attack us. We're still in a quite a secure country. But there are plenty of enemies of God and of the gospel. And our table is prepared in their presence. This is not a feast that is private or hidden away in a corner. <coughs> but it's on full view of the whole world. And I think that's 
a small glimpse of how our Christian lives are supposed to be lived out. We're not called to be spies for Jesus, we're called to be ambassadors mm. of the living God. To take his word out, to tell others. And when people come to us, we don't push them away, we tell them too. Jesus calls us the light of the world. We are cities on a hill whose light cannot be hidden. We can't and we should not hide the joy that fills our soul. It's a joy that should naturally radiate from us. It's not that we should boast as Christians that we're better than anyone else. I think we know that we're not. We're not better or smarter or stronger or holier than anyone else. But we can boast in him who saved us, in him who redeemed us, in him who has showed us such great love. 2 Corinthians 4 verses 6 to 7 says, For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We're earthen vessels, like a, a clay vase that has been formed and shaped by God our potter. But because of the sin and disobedience in our lives, it's like we have lots of cracks in us. A, a cracked clay vase. But we have the light of Christ in us. And light can shine through those cracks. We're not perfect. We don't claim to be perfect. But our brokenness, our sinfulness can allow the light of Christ to shine through us in amazing ways. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And these are words which, again, speak forward into eternity. It's like when Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there, you may be also. For those words of preparing a table, preparing a place for us, they speak ahead. It's something that we can latch onto, that we can hold tight of whenever we may be suffering. Because we will dwell with the Lord forever when he returns in majesty, in perfection, in glory, in utter splendor beyond anything this world can offer. And it also reminds us of the abundance of love and joy and grace, mercy and peace that we can partake of now in our lives as children of the living God. So on to the second part of the verse. You anoint my head with oil. I think, to, at least to me, this it can seem quite a, a very old, antiquated uh, line if you like, part of the verse. We don't generally go around anointing people on the head with oil, or at least I don't, or we don't in Cambridge anyway. <laughs> but in some circles, it, it still continues. I, uh, there are some churches where they anoint uh, new pastors or church workers, and they may do so with oil. But also, I think, most, maybe most prominently and recently, we saw it at the king's coronation, didn't we? Oh, well, we would have if they didn't put the, the, the screens in the way at that time. But at King Charles' coronation service. Uh, I won't ask if there's any royal family fans or anything like that. But me and Rachel watched it. Uh, and Rachel's dad was visiting us from Nigeria at the time. Uh, so we watched it. And we all 
I think we were all surprised in a bit by how Christian it was. But there were lots of different Christian elements, Bible verses and songs and such. And there, were this, there was this part in the service, this anointing of the king with oil. And I thought it was the part of the service where the king looked at his most vulnerable. He had to remove his uh, outer robes, I think the, the robes of state. And he then kneeled before the archbishop and was anointed on the head and the hands with oil. <coughs> and there's a bit from, I looked it up, there, there was a, an official uh, liturgy um, when the king removed his robes to be anointed. Uh, I'll just read a bit of that now. And it describes what the anointing is for, the purpose of it. It says, drawing upon the imagery and symbolism of the king's simple clothing, we see him prepared to undergo an anointing or consecration. The king's anointing sets him apart to fulfill a vocation and begin a new life as sovereign, dedicated to the service of all. So there was a, a well-defined purpose to this anointing. It was a public spectacle that the king was being, if you like, set aside for this role to take up this role as monarch. And the whole ceremony was steeped in biblical history. There was um, the choir sang Handel's The Anthem of Zadok the Priest. And that was sung. That reference is a passage from 1 Kings 1, 34 to 45. I won't sing it, but it says, Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed Solomon king. And all the people rejoiced and said, God save the king. Long live the king. May the king live forever. Hallelujah. Amen. And there are many examples, especially in the Old Testament, of people being anointed for different roles. We can think of those like David and Solomon being anointed as kings. People were anointed to become priests and prophets. And there were even objects like spoons and bowls that were anointed uh, to be used in the tabernacle. Why? It's not just people, but things. What, 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 what is all this anointing for? And I, I, I don't think I have ever quoted the Archbishop of Canterbury, but I will make one, an exception here. As part of one of his prayers when he prayed to bless the oil which then anointed the king, uh, he said, Blessed art thou, sovereign God, upholding with thy grace all who are called to thy service. Thy prophets of old anointed priests and kings to serve in thy name, and in the fullness of time, thine only Son was anointed by the Holy Spirit to be the Christ, the Saviour and Servant of all. All those biblical people in the Old and the New Testament were anointed not just to be kings or priests or prophets, but they were anointed into God's service. Even Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the Chosen One, was publicly anointed. And later with oils, fragrant oils, but first with the Holy Spirit, which descended upon Christ like a dove at Jesus' baptism. And we may not physically be anointed with oil, but as born-again believers in Christ, we do receive the Holy Spirit of God. We are anointed with the Holy Spirit of God. He dwells within us. He guards us. He secures us. He convicts us and guides us. There are often lots of different misconceptions about the Holy Spirit and his role uh, in a believer's life. The Holy Spirit is definitely not some like wooshy sci-fi aura that we feel or we can use. It's not like the force in Star Wars. But he is a very real 
and living presence, the very real and living presence of God who dwells in a believer. We become a temple for the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is dependable. We can trust in him because he will always point us to Jesus. He will always point us to God's word. He will always direct our hearts, direct our minds, not magnifying our own struggles or troubles, nor highlighting our strengths or how we might be able to solve the situation. But the Holy Spirit will point to Christ's infinite power, his strength and the reassurance found in the sufficient words of Scripture. The Holy Spirit is our counselor, our comforter is the giver of wisdom and power, not earthly power which fades and comes and goes, but heavenly power which remains. Mm. And he is our guide, as he was to the disciples when Jesus ascended and they were thought they were left alone. Mm. But he came to them, empowered them, and enabled them to do great things for God. We have been anointed with the Holy Spirit. And we have been anointed to be witnesses and ministers of the living word of God and the good news of the gospel. And that, I think, can take numerous forms. Not everyone is called to be a church leader, a pastor, a minister, an evangelist. We praise God that there are many who are given that gift and that anointing. Others encourage, others teach in different ways, others edify and build one another up. There are many who we rely on in church life to help out practically. All of those are forms of God's blessing and anointing of his people. And one thing that every single Christian believer is anointed to, we are all called to be ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven. We all represent God in thought and word and action. I remember when I was in secondary school and I may have been at an assembly at the start of the year, We'd all gather as a year group or even as a whole school. And maybe the head teacher would get up and say, every time you wear the school uniform, you're representing the school. So you better be on your best behavior, whether you're in school, on school grounds, or if you're outside of school. Because if you wear the badge or the emblem of the school, you're representing that school. We represent God. And that might frighten some of us a a, a little bit. How could we ever hope to represent God, the endless, all-powerful, living God? We may say things to ourselves that I didn't go to Bible college. I'm not a trained apologist or evangelist. I, I simply don't have the qualifications But, brothers and sisters, if we are in Christ by faith, then we have been given his Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who qualifies us to be ambassadors of Christ. Not what we do, but it's him who speaks through us. It's him who uses us in all our faults and failings. So he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our head with oil. And the final bit, (laughs) my cup runs over. What's the result of our anointing? Well, our cup runs over. It overflows. In other words, it overflows with abundance and prosperity, not of this world, Not necessarily with possessions and stuff. But in our faith, in our spiritual lives. 
even when we may not see it. Even when we're feeling low or we've messed up or if we feel like we've talked to a friend and and given him the wrong perception of God, if we've messed up and we think we've pushed someone away from God. But as believers, we live our lives to a different calling, one not of this world. It's not a life to accumulate possessions and material goods, but it is a life to glorify God. Our lives, after all, aren't ours. They've been bought by Christ at a great cost. And I love the verse in Galatians 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It might not often feel like our spiritual lives are overflowing. But when we share the gospel with someone, when we preach the good news, either in church or to our loved ones or to friends or to strangers, when we comfort someone in mourning, when we feed the hungry, when we encourage one another, when we help to sow the seed of the living word of God, when we pray for those around us, when we lift up to God those who are being persecuted, those who are in need, (coughs) when we act like Christ, when we live our lives as Christ lived his, then our cup overflows. It overflows with love, with joy, with peace, with long-suffering, with kindness, with goodness, with faithfulness, with gentleness, and with self-control. The fruits of the Spirit who dwells within us. Is your cup overflowing today? Is mine? If we can answer with a yes, we can praise God. May that continue. If it is not, let us come to Jesus. Let us come to our good shepherd. Let us come to our host at the table. He's the lifter of our head. And he's the one who is able and is very willing to fill our cup. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for so many blessings that you have given unto us. We thank you that we can sing of the blessed assurance that Jesus is ours, not because of anything that we have done, but it's all because of you and your grace that you have poured out upon us, Lord. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins that you have won for us, We thank you for the shed blood of Christ, which washes away our sins as if they never happened. We thank you for the the righteousness of Christ, which clothes us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who dwells within us, who strengthens us and guides us and always points us to you and your word. We pray, Lord, that we would lean not on our own understanding, but on the strength that is in, within us that was also in Christ Jesus. Continue to lead us, continue to guide us, Lord, our good shepherd, and continue to fill our cup, Lord, that it may overflow with the fruits of the Spirit, not for our gain or our glory, but for yours, Lord, for the furtherance of your kingdom. Be with us. Bless everyone in this room and those who can't make it as well, Lord. Bless them abundantly, we pray. We thank you for the ministry of this church in this area. And we pray, Lord, 
that as they continue to lift you up, you will continue to lift them up as well. So that many will see your grace, your mercy, your love, that you are all too willing to show to this world in darkness. So we thank you and praise you, Father God, for all good things which come from you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. I think, as usual, we'll close with uh, Psalm, not not Psalm, with hymn number 660, uh, which is Psalm 23, put to music. Um, So I think we can stand when the music is played. Hymn number 660. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen.